Hi, welcome to TV Soap. I'm Andrew Mercado, and I'm so thrilled today to be talking to someone that was around TV a lot in the late 70s and the 80s, but she hasn't been on TV for a while, but there's a very full life that she has been leading. Gaynor Wheatley, thank you so much for coming on to this show. Andrew, I'm thrilled to bits to be part of it. Thank you. Now, of course, we are referring to your work when you were known as Gaynor Martin. And I'm just wondering, in, in terms of setting the scene for all of your TV roles that followed, tell us a bit about your childhood and in particular if you were studying acting or wanting to be an actress and whether or not there were members of your family that were watching serials and soaps on TV because you did end up being in a lot of them. I would like to say that it was um, a dream that I um, had and realised, but I always wanted to be um, a sports teacher. And I actually did, I went to university and did phys ed and worked with handicapped kids, taught them swimming, and that's that's what I loved. Um, Of course, the pay was fairly meagre, so in my spare time I would... um, Uh, do television commercials and that's where I suppose my family came into it my mother got me an agent and I did some really terrific um, television commercials and that's how how I had a um, an an agent so whilst it was never really a a dream of mine to be um, an actor when they couldn't find the person that looked like the the prodigy of Carmen Duncan and Tony Bonner, they went into people who couldn't act, act just models, and that's where I uh, I came into it. Fortunately, I looked a little bit like both of them, and that's when the acting lessons and everything began. Now, if we go to Skyways, which is the the show where you played the the daughter of them, I've got this little. Uh, booklet that came out in TV Week Skyways and it talks about you and your character and it says Gaynor Martin has appeared in TV commercials since the age of 15. Uh, She has done minor parts for Crawfords and Skyways is her first major acting role and it says that you studied arts drama at Melbourne State College and you were a qualified swimming instructor as you just said then, yeah. I'm very glad I didn't contradict myself. It was a very long (laughs) time ago. I actually did enrol in arts um, and drama and I lasted about a month and I I wanted to be, I wanted to be phys ed. So I went to Preston Tech and did, and did that, which was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Let me tell you. Now tell you a story about the press, which I'm sure you'll identify with newspapers getting something wrong. Who could believe that? (laughs) But Several years ago, the Sunday Telegraph did this feature on the 50 greatest characters on Australian TV. And the person who wrote it clearly hadn't watched a lot of TV in the 70s, but had watched a lot of TV in the 80s because 15 of the 50 characters were from a country practice, including Fatso the Wombat. (laughs) And around 47 or 48, Skyways gets this mention with Paul McFarlane, played by Tony Bonner. And this person wrote, I don't know this TV show. I don't know anything about it. But one of the guys in the office said, Tony Bonner's a legend because he got to make out with Gaynor Martin. And I was like, they were playing father and daughter. Oh, Get it right. We, we did so not make out. <laughs> There was there was the odd kiss on the cheek, you know. Hi, Dad. Bye, Dad. But uh, <laughs> but Tony was great to 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 work with, and I'm still in constant touch with him. And um, uh, uh, he's yeah been a wonderful friend, father figure <laughs> all, all my life. <laughs> now you had a brother on the show, non identical twin, as played by Andrew McCaig, and it, he was sort of always getting into problems, but you were Mandy McFarlane. You were the nice daughter. In fact, your father, Paul, he referred to you as his chief advisor because you ran the household and had been running it ever since Mother Elaine, played by Carmen Duncan, had left the marriage. That is correct. Poor poor Andrew, he did get the bum steer and he was the far more talented of the two of us, let me tell you. But my halo was shining and I and I, I seemed to know what to do in the household. <laughs> yeah. 
Now, of course, in those early episodes, uh, you manoeuvred and uh, agitated for Elaine to return to the marriage and sort of set up romantic dinners to get your parents back together again. I mean, Carmen Duncan playing your mother, what a glamorous woman to be playing your mum. And what a beautiful, talented, gifted and giving um, actress to have. I mean, here I was, nobody, yet all these cast members could have dismissed me so easily, yet, you know, Tony and, and, and Carmen were so, you know, helpful and 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 giving and sort of set me up for success, which I will be forever grateful. But I remember remember some of those scenes and it was a bit a bit like, you know, Hayley Mills in Parent Trap. I was always, I think they took it from that book. I was always setting up impossible rendezvous for them. But it it worked, I think. I think you're onto something there. You know, often I am talking to script writers and they talk about a storyline. They go, oh, that was us doing All About Eve or take doing Rebecca. They just went to Hollywood classics and just literally stole the storylines and put them into the, the soaps. We had a great writer, Terry Stapleton, who I'm sure he, he had enough creative and original ideas, but it did feel a bit parent trap, only because I was such a huge fan of Hayley Mills at the time that I did kind of recognise some of the um, similarities. Now, Mandy was a virgin. I think she was a college student. She was going to art school, but she was a virgin. And there was a lot made of this because when she got her first boyfriend, he was a musician, Steve, as played by Frank Housen. And he was out to take Mandy's virginity. There was a little bit of stress about that. But your mother, Elaine, who'd come back, when Paul went away on a conference somewhere, she took her daughter to this wild party being thrown by some of the air hosties and Mandy got drunk and passed out and Elaine, who'd been flirting with her boyfriend, ended up getting raped by him. Do you remember that? I, I, I do. I remember a lot about that particular because there was some very, it was some, it was aw- an awkward storyline, especially because Mandy was only 16 and and I remember Frank was a NIDA graduate and we were all very in awe of his um, uh, pedigree. And we were, we were put into some, I don't know, very sort of sensitive areas to play with. I'm sure everything would have been um, uh, reworked in this day and age, or maybe not. We would have been probably naked and it wouldn't have even been an issue. But, but back then in the late 70s, it, it was, was quite risque and for then to have Carmen um, uh, raped by him, uh, th- they touched on some pretty pretty heavy stuff for the old. We were an 8.30 time slot. It wasn't for, you know, anyone younger, but it was it was pretty powerful stuff. Now, I'm going to correct you there. You were actually a 9.30 time slot because mm-hmm. Cop Shop would come on at 8.30, then Skyways, because Skyways was basically commissioned. It was Seven's answer to try to knock the Don Lane show off its perch on nine. It was winning the time slot at 9.30. And Skyways was always the competitor. And, of course, that meant the ratings went up and down. If Don had some fantastic guest on the satellite that you couldn't compete with, he'd win the time slot. But then sometimes if he didn't have a great guest, you know, Skyways. But Skyways ratings were often up and down. Yes, I I remember the old ratings book and sort of lived and died by the sword uh, in, in that respect in those days. If I go back and look at some of my old scrapbooks that I kept as a kid, it's interesting. I kept this ad for Skyways. And one of the reasons that I kept it is because I thought it was interesting that Seven were kind of rebranding the show. I thought very similar to the airport movies of the 70s. You know, you had airport and then airport 1975 and 1970. And there was an airport 80 called the Concord. And I thought they're Skyways trying to make out that it's kind of a new show in a new year. It was in its second year by then. There was always a real effort to try and keep the show because it, it 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 would rate well in Melbourne, but it didn't rate as well in Sydney. And that was always a problem back then in those days of TV. I think, yes, we were very parochial. And because it was all, we never got to film anything in Sydney. I think nowadays you really need to spread your wings. 
literally. Um, but we were always very Melbourne centric, Melbourne airport, you know, the simulator down there, Crawford's was there. So yes, we had a lot of Melbourne attention. It would have been, um, I think I remember when I got engaged to Bartholomew John, Nick Granger, we yeah. went up onto the Hawkesbury and that was a big deal because we were, you know, in, in Sydney and trying to bring Sydney into into the show, but probably a little bit more airport um, at work at Sydney Airport would have been, could have helped, I don't know. But mm. Channel 7 were terribly supportive from, from the top down to try and get this show to be a, a, a classic. Now, Mandy, of course, became an air hostess with TransAsia Airlines in the show, and her first flight was to Hong Kong, and they they had done this before. This kind of layover in Hong Kong was a regular story feature that came up, and they'd always use stock footage and then some, you know, crummy set with, you know, an Asian extra and, like, being the porter bringing the bags to the room. But they actually flew you to Hong Kong and took you on an actual travel log. That must have been great. It was great, except I had to wear the trans Asia sort of uniform everywhere I went. And I remember it was like four degrees. It was January in Hong Kong. I've never been so cold, but I was smiling like the proud stewardess that I was. Um, but we did. Uh, I think TV Week came up with us and we had uh, a, a few days in Hong Kong. And then we went to an island called Mindanao, which was um, for more, you know, PR, publicity, I don't know what on earth we were doing in that obsolete island. It was very beautiful, but um, we, at, at night we'd hear pirates in the distance and we couldn't go outside of our room in case, you know, I got kidnapped. But anyway, I digress. Yes, we did. We actually went to to, to Hong Kong, which was, that was pretty extravagant and pretty cool. I'm glad at least that Skyways didn't bring in a white slavery storyline. They did just about everything else during the run of that show. Um, we, we talked briefly, Skyways was launched as being, for Channel 7 certainly, a very adult show. The tagline when it started was adult TV drama takes off. And Jock Blair, you know, one of the producers of the show, said to me, he said, look, there wasn't a lot of nudity in the show. Seven weren't really into that. Seven's idea of raunchy was an unmarried couple in bed. But, you know, it's interesting because Bill Stalker said something interesting after the show had been axed. He said that the first scripts that he had read made it look like the adult sex sizzler of the 80s. But then it quickly became Little House on the Prairie with Wings. He was Peter Finelli, the security guard, and he started off saying bastard. He said they took the bloodies out of the script. And then he said, I was comforting kids within a few months. And he, he was really critical of the fact that the show didn't live up to its adult potential. But in, but in actual fact, they were kind of still pushing the barrow on a few things. Judy Morris playing the lesbian air hostess. And there were some little new flashes and stuff like that through the show yes they were, oh, that's interesting bill god rest his soul um who was a fabulous actor too and and a great character both on set and off set um that's interesting that the scripts changed i don't think they did for me i was always pretty sort of mandy mcfarlane all the way through but um I think I was so busy learning my 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 lines and my part that I, I I I can't remember Bill's character, but he did soften over that period of time. Yeah. Um, yes, for the from the gruff security man to I think comforting smaller people. <laughs> now you mentioned in fact, uh, Mandy did get engaged to uh, Nick Granger, the the very handsome pilot. But Bartholomew left the show and his character was sent to NASA where he was studying to be an astronaut, which I used to find hilarious because one of his big storylines in Skyways was when he and John Walton crashed a plane full of explosives in Tasmania. And it was like, seriously, you're sending a guy who crashed a plane to become an astronaut. 
<laughs> what could possibly go wrong? What could I know, possibly I, go wrong? I, I think Bart had another, went on to theatrical performances, stage plays or something. I think he'd had enough of landing in the drink or, or <laughs> getting, getting whatever they they threw at him. Um, but that was, I remember Mandy was, my character was heartbroken when he left to, to become said astronaut. But, yes, it is interesting. Wouldn't you love to be a script writer and, and, pluck some of these extraordinary stories and send these people to all these different places. <laughs> I forgot about him being an astronaut. Oh, my goodness. Love it. One of the more notor- notorious things about Skyways was when they launched the show, they were kind of going, oh, we've got like you know millions and millions of dollars of props because they were using this chroma key green screen. So when you'd go into Paul McFarlane's office or whoever was in charge of the airport from that time on, there was this giant window and outside the window, you could see the planes taxiing up and down the runway. But that chroma key was a nightmare. I never have talked to anybody that said it was an easy process. Jock Blair said it, it took them so long to use it that it meant that they would have to rush through other scenes, more important scenes, or sometimes drop them because they'd spent hours and hours trying to get the chroma key right. And Tina Bursell said that your hair had to be sprayed into an absolute helmet and that they looked like Thunderbird puppets every time they went in front of this green screen. <laughs> It's so true. You know, you get your script at the start or the end of the week and you'd go, how many scenes are, oh, no, okay, well, we've got, and well, we can push that back and we can push that back and we're not really due in the studio uh, until Wednesday because they've got, you know, Tina and, and Paul McFarlane and everyone doing the office scenes or there was a couple, there was a, two others that were on Chroma Key. Anyhow, it was, it was always... It was always very difficult. And Tina is a perfectionist, always was, always will be, and her hair still remains to this day pretty perfect. <laughs> it, it it was a nightmare. It's it's funny. I, if you look at the episodes uh, from 1975 with number 96 when the show's going from black and white to colour, and in black and white, you know, you have the wine bar and the delicatessen and outside this street which used to just be a painted backdrop. And in black and white, you could get away with that. And then when they went to colour, it looked like a really cheap backdrop. And they put in the chroma key and had the cars and the buses going past. But it was only in the show for a couple of months and they went back to that awful painted backdrop. And that tells me that they too had massive problems with it and just said, we don't have time to use this technology. And I guess Crawford's thought a few years had passed since then that they'd give it another shot. But I note that, you know, they never did it again in any of their other shows afterwards. No, because time was money in those days. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was a big cast to have on call waiting, waiting, waiting. So, um, yeah, I, I understand why it would have been retired. But it was great that they gave it a go. And that's what was so good about Skyways is they gave so much a go. They tried to make it as real as possible. I spent so much time in the simulator at ANSET, you know, on real slides in real pieces of aircraft, um, which I thought was terrific. They didn't, we did have a, a, an empty sort of shell at, at Crawford Productions, but a lot of the stuff was, you know, really on site. Oh, I agree with you. It was a great time in Australian TV and Skyways was an ambitious series. And that was back in the days when, you know, there were hours and hours of Australian drama on TV. And I agree, Skyways was trying to take it up to the next level. And you've just mentioned it had a big cast. I mean, it had an incredible cast over those 188 episodes it was on air. I mean, there was Chris McQuaid, Joanne Samuel, Ken James, Kerry Armstrong, Gerard Kennedy, Maury Fields, and someone who was became a great mate of yours because you told some of the magazines at the time that you went on holidays with her when the, the show was on a break. It was Tina Bursell and you two jetted off to the US and went and saw shows and bought lots and lots of clothes. <laughs> That guilty, guilty, we did. We had a great time. Um, uh, Tina is, you know, one of those very, very special people in my life and still is. Um, yeah, we had that. That was a great time. <laughs> in between shows, I think I was going, I had about six-week break or something in between 
my next um, venture with Crawfords. So we we made made hay while the sun shone, so to speak. You said something very sweet to the press when Skyways was coming to an end because your final scene in that last episode was uh, Nick had sent, I think, an engagement ring through someone in the mail or an offer of marriage. And so Mandy was like, great, I'm going to fly off and I'm going to marry the love of my life. And it was an emotional scene. But you told the press that, you know, it, you were emotional in that scene, but you were emotional because the series was coming to an end and you were really going to miss all your friends. And you talked about walking around on that last day, looking at the set, sad that it was all coming to an end. I, I, I was devastated. I, we, I think we all were. I think we were all, we all knew we were so close to having something that could have, you know, great longevity. I think that cast gelled like, uh, I'm sure other casts have you know great cop shop casts were all great but this this was a particular group of people that were really emotionally connected and and very close and very as I said before very very giving and extremely talented I mean it was it was a privilege this is interesting you were actually contracted to Crawford's production Forever. I was forever. I was I signed on the dotted line and went, yes, take pick me, pick me. <laughs> Which was great because as you just alluded to then, you had a six-week break and then Crawford slotted you into a drama they were making on the O10 network, Holiday Island, the infamous soapy <laughs> Holiday Island, set on a Queensland tropical resort on the Great Barrier Reef, but filmed in Nunawading suburban Melbourne. Now, you know, when I said I was cold in Hong Kong, well, that was nothing compared to wearing a bikini, running over the, the sand dunes and the sand and the hills of, you know, the Carnegie sand pits. That was, was it Cranburn? I think it was Cranburn, <laughs> but it was so cold. And, of course, we used to have to, if we were in the swimming pool, they would have to turn the, the pool, which was heated off because the steam rose, and we would have to suck ice blocks so when we spoke, we didn't have steam coming out of our mouths. Now that was a, that was a, an ambitious project that would have and could have and should have worked up on an island, even ten degrees miles north of Melbourne, where it was anything. Just it was so cold; it could just just couldn't happen. That was a gutsy role. I loved I loved that character. She was great. You were playing Kylie, Kylie. MacArthur. She was the you you described her as a rich, spoiled brat. She was the niece of Emily Muldoon, I think, who seemed to own the island. She was played by the wonderful oh. Patricia Kennedy. I know. How lucky was I? I got to work with Bud Tingwell as a director in Skyways, and then I moved on to Patricia Kennedy, who had her work cut out with me let me tell you but she was once again so giving and gracious in fact I used to go to her place on a every Tuesday afternoon and she would you know work with me which was just wonderful um obviously they're a little bit desperate but um she was great to to have there uh, that was another brilliant you know cast we had Stephen Gribes um Patricia who else was it? it was just it was another really good cast, but it was a task too high for us all to achieve, being the location that it was. Yeah, like. yeah, and I mean honestly, the, a Melbourne winter was never going to look great on camera. Yeah, at the time I used to work for the Queensland Tourist and Travel Corporation, and my entire nine to five job was booking people to the Gold Coast or booking them to Queensland Islands. And we were going to a lot of those Great Barrier Reef Islands. And then I would be watching Holiday Island and like going, how are they having a surf contest on this island? It's on the Great Barrier Reef. There's no surf there. And there's Peter Mockery running around with, with a surfboard. And I'm like, going, this is insane. <laughs> oh, I know. It was, oh, anything to put Peter in a pair of Speedos, I think, at the time. But uh... You mentioned uh, Stephen Gribes there. He played the baddie of the yes. show, Nick Tate's yes. on-screen brother. His, his character name was Jason. And you said that he taught you to be nasty because Kylie and 
Jason were teamed up to try and fleece Emily Muldoon of all her money and and you said that he was a fantastic mentor to you and 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 taught you having played a nice girl on Skyways he taught you how to be nasty and I love playing nasty nice to everybody is hard work I could come to the set you know on Holiday Island and you know not be in a pleasant mood and it just fed and Stephen was he was mean and he, he acted it was great. I, I thoroughly enjoyed that combination um, because, yes, I was able to feed off. He was, he was a great actor, Stephen, really, really terrific. So and I was very I was very happy there. Alison Best also called you out in the press. She said she said she was so happy that your character had come on to the show because it gave her character someone to sort of, you know, butt heads with. But she said that you and her became great friends and she said that you had really helped her. She said you had gone through the mill on Skyways and that you'd had that she and you had had great talks about how you had coped. And I wonder what you mean by going through the mill and I mean, a lot of actors who've been in Crawford shows often allude to they, it was a great company to work for, but wow, you worked incredibly long hours and maybe too long hours. Yes, we did work, especially when you were on the lower rungs um, and I was contracted. So I, I think I was getting like $280 a week and, and, and I, I worked really hard, very long hours. And also they were trying to build me, Gain or Martin, up. So the, when I wasn't working, I was doing press. And I was I was ex too, I was exhausted. And I remember Alison was sort of new and it was like a fresh face. And you know, the channel 10 sort of machine started getting behind her. And I just said, you can say no. You can actually say no, and it took me a very long time to say no. I wanted to be, I wanted to be liked. I wanted to be um, uh, am amicable. I wanted to do my very best. So I said yes and yes. But I, I remember just being woken up when flights landed, <laughs> going, "You've got to get off now," because that was the bit of sleep. We'd be doing a Perth telethon or a Queensland telethon or doing something somewhere. And I remember being really tired. And because I got paid so little, I actually got, you know, a, a job cleaning flats when um, people moved out so that I could get some money because I needed clothes. I was going to premieres or going here or going, and I didn't have wardrobe. Now, of course, everyone gives you what would you like to wear and how many of these, um, you know, in which colour. But back in those days, you had to buy your clothes. Even for cover shots of, you know, TV week, I'd be wearing my own clothes or whatever. So it, it, it was it was it was a tough time. But I, I I'm glad Alison learned that. I did say just say say no. Say there's only so much you can do physically. That's very revealing that you say you're only paid two hundred and eighty dollars a week because that's not a lot for the amount of work you're doing particularly not a lot when you compare that to Tina Bursell, who by that stage was a more experienced actress and her role as Louise Carter, you know, you know, the running, she was kind of being, she was playing that strong woman on TV, which we used to call a bitch back in the 80s. I mean, you're a strong woman, you have to be the bitch. But she was being paid two and a half thousand dollars per week. But she always said that there was, you know, there was a, a sting in the tail of that because she said that was Crawford's, paying her for overtime up front. And she says the same thing, you know, just literally being worked on weekends, publicity, telethons, crazy hours. Yeah. And I remember it used to take me like half an hour to get home and I'd finish in the studio maybe 11 o'clock at night. And and by the time you got home and had something to eat and got to bed and you were back at 6 a.m., um, even if your first sort of scene was maybe, you know, 7, 7.15 and then you didn't have anything till 1 o'clock, I, I was sort of like, you know, and Andrew McCaig was the same. He was, he was 
you know, we were sort of not the fillers, but we were we were able to be, you know, sit around and they could slot in our scenes when they had a when the chroma key broke down, they could pop us in and do. I remember walking onto the set trying learning the lines as you know, someone just you know, popped in a scene to 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 fill the time for something that was next week. It was crazy stuff, but gosh, what a great, what a great learning platform. Uh, you could do anything once you did that, except tax lotto. I could never do that tax lotto thing. That was terrifying, but don't worry about that. Back then, there was a, a lot of uh, time. There was more time spent on making soaps than are made today. You know, you know, one of the actors from The Young and the Restless told me that they're on such a fast schedule these days, making an hour of television per day. She said, I literally don't even look at my lines until I'm walking onto the set. I just get the script, look at it, try and memorise it, get the sense of it. And she yeah. said, you know, the, the problem with that is that we're good actors and we get it right. And she said, just when we think they can't speed it up anymore, they do um, because they're always going to take advantage. But if we talk about you um, maybe wearing your own clothes, I found this press kitting, press cutting from Holiday Island. So I'm wondering if you can recognise any of those <laughs> outfits. Island. Yes, they were all Clarence Chai. Wow. I loved him. He was he was he was fabulous. In fact, he made my rather outrageous wedding dress, which was, you know, apricot and Elizabethan. But uh yeah, Clarence was great. I probably borrowed a few of those things for that shoot, but I, I did buy a lot of Clarence chai, that's for sure. One of uh Kylie's more outrageous moments in Holiday Island for the time was she smoked marijuana. And uh, did your relatives cop some flack for that, for you playing a girl on TV that was smoking pot? I mean, you actually said to the press, I love it. You said you, you, you were getting bitter and twisted playing the ever-nice, ever-smiling Mandy on Skyway. So, of course, you're loving being on Holiday and doing all of these wild things now. Yes, I drank, I smoked, I guess, <laughs> rolled a mean doobie. But... Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't I, no, I think my, my family were okay because they knew I actually didn't smoke, um, which I was acting. It was fine. <laughs> I must have been doing a very good job. <laughs> One person that you mentioned was also invaluable to you during the making of Holiday Island was Bunny Brook, who was then the acting coach for Crawford. Now, of course, she played Flo Patterson in number 96 and probably was a bit typecast after that. And so she went be behind the scenes becoming an acting coach. Tell us about Bunny Brook uh, as another yep. person that helped you so much. Yes, she she Peter Mockery and I, she would basically follow us around and Alison and she would she would just always have our scripts in her hand and she'd be working us right up until we sort of did the scene. She was she was great and encouraging, you know, she was never critical. So that you sort of went, Oh, I can't do this. She was like, that was great, but my goodness, what if we did it this way? What if we didn't speak with that sort of inflection? What if we just Let's just take this somewhere else. And she was just, yeah, gosh, I was lucky. Crawford's well, actually were doing something really fun with their shows back then. They started transferring characters from one show to another. So Peter Finelli, played by Bill Stalker, went from Skyways to Cop Shop. And then on Holiday Island, old George Tibbet, played by Brian James, he was on long service leave and he came and had this extended stay on Holiday Island. I mean, Holiday Island was this show, wasn't it, that it was kind of like the love boat. They, they would, there was this regular cast, but then there'd be all these visitors that would come in every week for the two-parter and do their sort of stories of the week. Crawford's was like that. Once you were in the Crawford family, they they did look after you, you know, and Brian James, who better to look after, what a beautiful man he was. Um, he, yes, they did. They looked after you and kept you, all, all their working actors, they kept working because they, they did have a lot on, but they were very, they were very gracious and very, um, accommodating with everybody the the last thing any of those people wanted was to see you you know out there struggling they they were they were great like that I, I didn't work very much for Grundy's but for the Crawford family that that was that was they were special 
Well, these are the days of Crawford's when they had their studio at Abbotsford, which they used to call Hollywood on the Yarra. That was, <laughs> you know, famously used as the exterior shots for Channel 12 for the box. But this was Hector Crawford's vision to have an, a, a kind of a self-made studio where they could do everything in-house, wardrobe, editing, all of this. And, and of course, that was causing a bit of ructions in the TV industry at the time. Some of the networks always thought that Hector Crawford was getting a bit bit too big for his boots. But tell us about Hector Crawford as this, you know, incredible figure. And of course, you growing up in Melbourne would know that Hector Crawford wasn't just a TV guy. He made all these radio dramas with his sister, Dorothy Crawford. And I was absolutely amazed to read his biography, Hector, which is a fantastic read, and to learn that he had been a conductor in Melbourne in the 1930s. And it was his concerts conducting in the botanical gardens that had led to the building of the My Music Bowl. I had no idea that Hector Crawford had been such a force through Melbourne for so many years. He certainly was, and he was a gentleman. And this beautiful, elegant, white-haired man would walk through. He was always at always at the studios, always at um, at um, in in Abbotsford. And you knew he was there. There was an energy in the building. He'd walk through the cafeteria. He'd just pop in on all the sets. He was he was a, 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 a kind and godlike. And I thought he was just just terrific. But I do I remember him conducting. My mother was quite is quite musical, and Hector Crawford was always the the, the conductor. So I knew him musically, not so much in the you know dramatic uh, era, but uh, no, when 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 he was in the building, you, you knew it, and you it was great. It wasn't scary, you know. It was good. It was like, oh, Hector's in here. He's gonna. Well, and he'd always remember your name, and he'd always say, "How's it going?" And I saw the rushes, or he'd just say something pertinent that would sort of kind of lift you. And uh, yeah, no, it was it was it was a good it was a good time to be part of that family yeah I sometimes feel that that's what's missing with TV today you know you've you had you had those moguls back then you know that they, they, they could be fearsome but they love TV and that and they wanted to make entertainment even though Holiday Island wasn't quite the success Crawfords were looking for um the critics unkindly one called it horror day on Iceland and another one called it Arcade with palm trees, referring to the flop of the shopping centre soap in the year before. But honestly, I mean, we, we did get a lot of laughs, unintentional laughs for Holiday Island for years afterwards. Daytime repeats, I remember, used to just be hilarious. <laughs> I was very close to John Blackman and he was on. Um, he he was on Holiday Island too, and he's you know got a wicked keen sense of humour. Well, he used to send us up. We we know what the the line or what the what we we're going to be sent up for because he would have done it you know the week before when we were doing the actual scene. We're going oh no, next week's going to be hell in the in the press or for for whatever reason. But John Blackman had normally picked whatever it was going to be, so we were slightly prepared. But you know, yet another stepping stone and yet another, you know, learning sort of phase for me and to be part of something that wasn't successful was, you know, it wasn't, wasn't great, but, you know, that taught, taught me a lot too. Not everything is, you know, wonderful. So true. Um, after Holiday Island, you left the safety of Crawford's and went from Melbourne to Sydney to Grundy's to appear on Sons and Daughters. Now, Sons and Daughters was a really big hit established show by now, but how different was it going from this incredible family atmosphere of Crawford's in Melbourne to what was you know, a, a different way of making television in Sydney with Grundy's? Terrifying. I remember being up all night the night before um, just because I was walking into a very well-established, you know, group of people and I, 
I actually then appreciated how it must have been for some of the guests on the shows that I'd been on to walk into. Uh, and But I also knew what we used to say about the people who were walking in and, you know, swanning in and taking over some, you know, special part. So I was like, I was sort of prepared. But um, I, had, I had Peter Phelps to work with and Cornelia Francis, and they made the transition, you know, very painless. So you came into the show as uh, Prue Armstrong, who was the niece of Barbara Armstrong, played by Cornelia Francis, and uh, Pat the Rat, Rowena Wallace, latched on to you because she thought that you'd make a great match for her son, John Palmer. She always wanted John to marry well, and so she really manipulated Prue into kind of forcing John's hand into marriage. So you did a lot of stuff with Rowena Wallace after that initial I, introduction. I know, I know. And she was so not the rat. She was so great and so much fun. Um, but, my goodness, you know, that camera came on and this other persona just was like, wow, I used to have to practice my personas. She would just go, that that camera flicked on and she was Pat the Rat and she was cool as ice and and and. And she was great. But, yes, no, I always seem to have rich aunts or <laughs> something uh, going on in the background. But, uh, no, I, I, that, that, was, um, that was a completely different way of, of, of working, the Grundy's way. Um, but, you know, e e equally, not equally as good as Crawford's, but, you know, equally good um, people to work with and, you um, I don't know how long I was on there for. I remember basically because I, I I did a small stint and left the set and went home and married Glenn basically the next day. So that that it was. I don't think I was as impassioned about um, my role. I think also because I had Glenn in Melbourne and that's where I wanted to be. And I think I had the option to to stay on, but. Uh, I my heart was in Melbourne. What can I say? One of the interesting I noticed is that you literally took a new hairstyle to every show you're in. Mandy and Skyways had long hair. It's a little bit shorter for Kylie, and then for Prue, you you went for a shorter cut. Was that you deciding, hey, I'm going to create a new look for each character, or was it a coincidence? Mandy, I wanted the long blonde hair. Um, Kylie. Yeah, that there could have been a perm involved. Big mistake. But you know, it was a bit sort of edgier. And then I, I wanted something sort of slick and sort of smooth for for um for Prue to go with the name Prue. I don't know. Why would I I don't know why I was thinking names and hairstyles, but um I think I could only go shorter. I couldn't sort of that was before the days of extensions, I think. I couldn't go long. So I, I went short. Well, also, if you're in a long-running TV role, you can't just change your hair when you want to, right? It has to all be sorted through the production. So you very cleverly go, well, this is the chance now. If you're going to change your look, you do it between shows, not halfway in the middle of a show's run. Yes, continuity was the bane of my life. <laughs> one, one of the things I really, really remember about your marriage to Glenn Wheatley is that it was on the cover of TV Week. Glenn was this big star in his own right, but he was marrying you and you were this big TV star there. And so you were on the cover of TV Week with that wedding, which, you know, and I've often wondered, you know, the press literally hounded you and Glenn for the rest of your life. And it's kind of that double-edged sword, isn't it? You know, they they celebrate you when they want to celebrate you, but by God, they're sitting there waiting for you the moment something goes wrong. Yes, and Glenn was always very philosophical about that, you know, in his business. And I think as all actors, we need the press as much as the press needs us. So you've got to be there for each other, good times and bads. Bad. And Glenn always made himself accessible and you, you you can't just take all the good and take the you know the glamour shots and then when things go pear-shaped um you know shut down so I think we've always both of us but particularly Glenn has always tried to be honest open and respectful of, of the press and and um that was very much his um his not not mantra but he was always very respectful and 
I, it worked, I think. You only seem to act one more time after that. You're in a show called The Fast Lane in 1985, which was kind of like an ABC Australian version of Minder. Um, and then you pretty much, I guess, retired from acting to you have three children. So you pretty much become a family and sort of involved on the sidelines in Glenn's many, many businesses. Yes, that was definitely, uh, I think there could only be one kind of um, central figure in our lives and you have to give everything if you're an actress and you have to be quite selfish and um, a little bit self-obsessed. But Glenn had so much on his plate and I did have three children very quickly that it wasn't really a conscious decision. It was, I was so happy being a mum and I was so happy being his wife that um, it was I had such a great time in the acting years that I was an actress. It was perfect. It was just the perfect time in my life. It was with great people. It opened my eyes up to the world. And, and then I married this beautiful man and had children. So I feel like everything was just staged as it should be. So many people mention you in these shows, and it's kind of crazy in a way because Skyways hasn't been repeated in years. Holiday Island hasn't been on TV for 40 years. The one show that has never gone away, though, is Sons and Daughters. It's always sort of somewhere being repeated, still streaming to this day on 7 Plus. They've put out every episode in a giant DVD box set. And, of course, you you get this incredible UK fan base with Sons and Daughters who are obsessed with the show and seem to know everything about it. Yes. I, I wish I could, I'd love to see Skyways packaged up in one of those Crawford boxes. Everybody else seems to be, all the other shows, but... That's the one probably I'm most proud of, um, and I would like to see that again. But I never spoke- say never, never say <laughs> never. I have I was down at Win TV with Danny from Crawford's, and you know they bring out you know they brought out all the Crawford cop shows, and they're doing the box and all this. And I was standing there like going, Danny, what about Skyways? Um, I asked him about Holiday Island. He said, No, they they won't be releasing. <laughs> But I'd love to show my grandchildren Skyways. <laughs> that, that, that I would like. <laughs> After Glenn's death, I listened to the audio book that he had recorded of his biography. And is it true that he'd done that audio book and you guys weren't really aware that he had been doing that quietly? I knew he was doing it, but what I didn't realise was uh, um, I wasn't really paying a lot of attention to a lot, he does a lot of things and it was also lockdown so he thought I'm not going to sit around during lockdown I'll record my book or let's get this documentary you know finding the voice moving along he was always very busy and very active um um the the timing and the pressure that he must have put on himself to complete that that's what I think is strange for me Do we know when our time is coming? It just felt like he was ticking a lot of boxes that in hindsight, I can, is that why? I don't know. I would really encourage people to listen to it. It's such an incredible story. So much music history and so much. And, And then it came to an end. And then about a week later, I was in this secondhand bookstore and going through the biographies. And it's like, oh, there's a... Glenn, I just listened to this book. And then I went, no, actually, this is a a follow-up. So I grabbed this book, read this book, which then finishes the the story up to it. And when I look at it today, there's this most incredible um, shot in here of his um, photo board when he was in jail. And there's there's a shot of you as super girl. Um, That's my daughter. That's your daughter. Gosh, it looks like you. Yes, but there's also my... these beautiful pictures of when, was it he had his 60th birthday and you yes. went outside of the prison and released balloons for him to see yes. inside? There, there, there was a, a lovely sort of mountain that, that he could see when he did his walk in the afternoon. So I just said, look, at 4 o'clock, look up. It was the only thing I could think of other than trying to bust him out, you know, bring him a birthday cake with whatever implements he needed um so we the family we all went up onto the hill and released balloons 
which we thought would go into the sky, but they didn't. They all, for some reason, tumbled down the hill. But he was able to look up and know that we were, you know, thinking of him on this very auspicious day. So, um, yeah. <laughs> he was a great writer. Uh, his audio book is great. This second novel is great. And so much history that I think is really important to Australian pop culture. And also the story of how he ended up in jail. It's like... It's very, very sobering and, you know, very unfortunate that he was treated as badly as he was. But then he had been working on this John Farnham documentary project and when he passed, you stepped up and took over that role. Tell us about you doing something, you know, quite amazing in making sure that that documentary got finished and ended up being released. I don't know where the inner strength actually came from because I really just wanted to hide under the doona. Um, but I knew he'd been working on this and I just thought it was going to, this story would not be told if I didn't, um, you know, just pick up the slack and and, and finish off what he what he had started and once again I wasn't paying attention he was talking about this documentary and he'd said I've done my interviews for this documentary and I'm like a documentary yes okay and I knew John wasn't really enthused about doing this documentary um you know he John's as you know quite humble and who wants to sort of hear about any of this anyhow I remember ringing up M M Martin Fabini who was my Glenn's contact point and I just said Martin look too much is of Glenn is it has been done can I meet with the producers can I meet with beyond can I meet with everybody and and, and see if we if I can't sort of you know move it to completion and I, I don't know who was more shocked them or or me that I would went and then had this meeting and I said I think we can do it I think we I can interview John and I think we could, too much is, is is already there, this story, especially now that Glenn's gone, I really want told. So that's what happened. And I know my interviews in it, I can't, I can't even recall them. I mean, I've seen them subsequently, but I, it was asking questions about Glenn and it was it was the most challenging thing I think I've ever done. I think it's now the highest grossing Australian documentary ever released in cinemas. They released its run then it went on Channel 7, got huge ratings. I went to see it in a cinema and, you know, just, the, just to hear the music coming out of those speakers and I went to a daytime screening. It was actually quite full. You know, sometimes you go to the movies in the middle of the day, no one's there, but there are a lot of people there. And when the, the lights came on and the credits were rolling, I could hear people all around me sobbing in the cinemas. I mean, that doco really hit people. I mean, thank you for making that doco. It's such a great testament to what John and Glenn Wheatley had achieved together and it's a great, great film. It's a love story. It's their love story. And it is just two of the most heterosexual men, but they had great belief and love and respect for each other. And as I say in it, John stood by us, we stood by him, and it's a great story and I'm, I'm really glad it's told. And the music, how good is the music? You forget just, you know, that man's voice, my Goodness, it's um, outstanding. You can't lose when you've got a soundtrack like that to, 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 to back up, you know, some of the fabulous vision that, that, that they had. And Poppy Stockel, the, the director, you know, she just, she just wove her way through really interesting parts of, you know, different stories and took not the, you know, normal track that you would think. Um, and, and that all, that, that was that was the best bit. We've talked about how, you know, scriptwriters come out with the most outrageous storyline for soaps. But honestly, if you look at your life, Glenn's life, John's life, like no scriptwriter could have come up with what happened there. But, I mean, honestly, you know, the Glenn Wheatley story, that would make one 
incredible mini series. I mean, if anyone approached you and said we wanted to turn his story into a biopic and all that, would you be into that or? <laughs> I don't know. I think I think just getting this period completed and getting through this last eighteen months. Be, is has been challenging enough. I think if anyone mentioned a biopic to me, I'd probably hit him over the head with the script. But um, I know Glenn's story is really is really interest is really interesting. He, he does have a great story, um, you know. But then it's sort of we all get back into the prison thing again, and it's sort of something I. You know, that, that's why you, facing the music when he wrote that and he said, I'm going out to promote it, I said, please, we've just we've just got a little bit of space between the prison and, and you know, starting a new life. I don't want to go back and rehash it. Um, I was very nervous about it in the documentary, but it's what happened and we certainly couldn't leave it out and it did happen and we, you know, did do the wrong thing and it has been a long time making up for, for that error of judgment. But, um, yes, a, a miniseries, eh? Who played me, though? That's, that, that's always <laughs> wow. the problem, isn't it? Yeah, that is a huge question. <laughs> wow. Well, I just, we just found a picture of your daughter that looked incredible. Oh, well, that's exactly like right. Cara, Cara could do it. <laughs> she, <laughs> she'd love to. <laughs> Look, um, I just want to thank you for years and years of uh, TV enjoyment. I mean, there were, you know, there were several years there you were on TV every week in, you know, some greatly remembered shows. And, yeah, I think all of us that loved you in those shows have always watched your life from afar and always had a soft spot for you because we always loved the characters that you played on TV. So I can't thank you enough for chatting to us about it and going on a trip down memory lane. I just want to thank you so much, Gaynor. Andrew, thank you. I, I was thrilled to do it. It's it's a bit like therapy, isn't it? But I, 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 I've never had therapy. I probably should. But thank you very much. It was a it was a great thrill to speak to you, and thank you for your support over the many years. I can't tell you now how. Well, gosh, it's forty years now. Of is it forty years or is it fifty years? It's a very long time. Not <laughs> quite fifty years, but yeah, Not it's it's definitely it's getting up to like maybe forty three, forty four. Okay. <laughs> It's a long time. It's a lot. Thank you so much. Thanks, Andrew. Bye-bye. See you. Bye. Bye.